Hi everyone, thank you for tuning in to our virtual launch of the 2019-2020 Lantern. You may or may not know me, have read my frantic emails, or have seen me running around campus, but my name is Nicole Kosar and I was the editor for the Lantern this year. Even though we can't do this in our natural environment of Olin Auditorium, we wanted to take the opportunity to thank everyone who helped with the Lantern this year, celebrate the winners of our three prizes, and more. Below you'll find a link to the online Lantern through the Library Commons, which I hope you take a look at. We've really had some wonderful authors and artists this year. So as we all know, this year was cut short for us. Seniors and underclassmen alike mourn the loss of our last months on campus of our graduation. After years of frantic essay writing and drunken philosophical conversations of best friends and maybe some enemies, after years of growing and changing, our last few weeks are gone. Our last chance to say goodbye is gone. But this is the 2020 issue of The Lantern. This is anything and everything left unsaid. Colleen Murphy will be reading Cochlea, Greek for Snail, as the Poetry Prize winner. Jeremy Moyer will read a selection from That Light in the Sky as the Prose Prize winner. Lastly, Adam Mladzinski will read a section from Overview Effect as the winner of the Krieger Prize. I hope you enjoy this year's launch, take a look at the online version, and are able to grab a physical copy of our beautiful edition this fall on, th on campus. My name is Jeremy Moyer, and I'll be reading for my short story, That Light in the Sky. On a sun-filled autumn morning, a butterfly landed elegantly atop a particularly tall blade of grass, gently folding its wings shut. The young girl lay on the ground, her eyes fixated on the butterfly, intently examining its every move. In a careful, gradual motion, the girl reached out her finger. Cautiously, the butterfly accepted the girl's offer. Mellow orange painted its wings like stained glass, outlined in a white dotted black that branched out from the body. The girl knew from the pattern and colors that what she held was a monarch butterfly, the first she'd seen this season. After taking in the beauty of the creature, she sat up and folded her legs, holding the butterfly up to the sky. The butterfly remained, comfortably resting on her index finger. She lowered it down to eye level. You don't want to go? She whispered softly. Rustling grass approached from behind the girl that was soon accompanied by a voice. What you got there, Clara? The man said. A butterfly, Clara said, her deep brown hair combed to the side of her forehead. I think something's wrong with him. The man crouched beside his daughter, glancing at the brightly colored creature. It's beautiful. Clara continued. He won't fly away. Maybe he's hungry. What do you say we get him something to eat? Clara turned to the man who returned his daughter's gaze. He had dark, even features and long legs, his charcoal hair falling loose on either side of his head. Can we really? Clara said, her face glowing with joyful anticipation. Alan smiled. Of course. The two of them lived in a woodland-style house that at first glance appeared to stand in the middle of nowhere, accompanied only by trees and wildlife. There was, however, a road within walking distance. Clara followed her dad through the front door, her eyes glued to the butterfly that rested on her finger. Bring him over here, Alan said, gathering the materials from the kitchen and setting them on the table. What are you doing? Clara said dubiously. Alan poured a small amount of sugar into a glass of water and dipped a sponge inside and set it on a paper towel, making Mr. Butterfly a little breakfast. Here, set him gently onto the sponge. Clara hovered her finger beside the sponge and the butterfly stepped on. She'd had a fascination with wildlife even before she could walk, a trait she inherited from her mother. Initially, this meant her chasing after squirrels and trying to catch anything she could get her hands on. She eventually learned that some animals were better admired from a distance. In fact, her knowledge about different species, both from reading and observing, had far surpassed her father's, to the point where he could no longer answer her questions. Questions that Alan knew his wife would have answered in a heartbeat. Thank you. Hi, my name is Colleen Murphy, and this is my poem, Cochlea, Greek for Snail. A man at a bar was trying to talk to a woman over loud music. When she asked him to repeat his question not once, not twice, but three times, he said, What are you, deaf? Her friends kicked him under the table and nodded their heads. They got married three years later. 
My father asks my mother if she wants steak or escargot for the entree, and she said, I hate snails. When we were little, she learned to sleep on her side, so her hearing aid was always facing up towards the ceiling, towards the empty air, waiting to be filled with whales. She was always the first one to the crib. She is in the living room teaching my sisters how to turn on their new hearing aids. I brush my fingers over my empty eardrum and disappear in the doorway. The snails follow me up the stairs. She's speaking to the doctors through the landline. She explains to them that she can't hear on the phone, that they have permission to relay all the information, all the test results to her husband. He finds out about the cancer underneath her own skin before she does. I think of the dead snail in my mother's ear. Cochlea is Greek for snail. Sometimes I see my mother moving slowly. I grew up to talk slowly. We inch along, steadily. We sit listening to music together in the car because she can't carry a conversation without looking at my lips. We sing to American Pie in between stop signs. We talk at red lights. I play the song three times and the snails on the dashboard dance along. Thank you. May 5th, 1961. Alan Shepard Jr. stared out of the periscope of the Freedom 7 capsule, observing the Earth from within its orbit, crashing through the thermosphere in a thin metal craft not that much bigger than a four-seater car. He currently had the periscope aimed near Florida and was swinging it down past the Gulf of Mexico. He was low enough that with the aid of the periscope he could quite easily make out individual islands in the Caribbean, St. Croix, and the Aruba. Doing his best to zoom out with the unwieldy technology, Alan managed to get a better look at the United States as a whole, or rather, as one part of a whole. Spotted clouds covered parts of the East Coast as his vision shifted onto the all-encompassing mass that was the Atlantic Ocean, and what lay beyond. Alan tore his eyes away from the view to look behind him, out of the only porthole on the small capsule and bulked at what he saw. A large rectangle made of an otherworldly-looking metal floated in the vacuum in front of him. This was not included in the mission briefing. Alan picked up the radio receiver to his left and pushed the talk button. Uh, Houston, there is an unidentified object in my flight path. It looks to be about four by eight feet in metal of some sort and motionless. How should I proceed? Over. Static greeted Alan on the other end of the receiver. Houston, I repeat, there is an unidentified object in my flight path. How should I proceed? Static again. Alan frowned as the capsule approached the shape and then stopped with a short metallic bang as it presumably connected with the object. With a deep hissing sound, the door to the capsule began to open outwards. Houston, I have made contact with the unidentified object. My door has opened, but I have not lost pressure. I am stepping out into the object to investigate. Over. Hi, this is John Volkmer, faculty advisor to The Lantern. Welcome to this year's online Lantern launch. I want to thank Nicole Kozar for doing a wonderful job as an editor under very difficult circumstances, and thanks to all her staff for their hard work. There will be a Lantern this year. It's being printed. You see the proof of the cover right there. It's a beautiful issue. It will be waiting for us in the fall, and everybody can have their hard copy. So, it's a great day to have another lantern. It's my pleasure now to announce the winner of the Dolman Prize, the Senior Portfolio Creative Writing Award. This year's judge is Rand Richards Cooper, noted author of two books of fiction and numerous articles. And um, he selected from the portfolios Jennifer Joseph as the winner. Congratulations, Jen. Um, about her lyrics, Rand Richards Cooper wrote in part, 
These trenchant confessional lyrics, poems of re recollection, regret, and recrimination display precision, verve, and some killer closing lines prompted by urgencies both political and personal. In second place, um, Rand selected Maddie Rodak for her poetry, about which he wrote, equally elusive and elusive, these carefully constructed short poems take up the magical and the mythological, conveying a love of literature and storytelling. Congratulations to Jen Joseph and Maddie Rodak, winner and runner-up for this year's Dolman Prize. Hello, Resinus College. Today I'm going to read to you one of my poems from the Dolman portfolio that I won. Um, this poem is a sonnet. It's called Christmas Club. Depression fits me like a Christmas glove. I wear her in my lack of turtle dove. Or else in dearth of bells and yuletide cheer. I am that cut of store-bought balsam fir, which stalks the homes of far more merry folk. I watchful eye my trimmings as a joke. I parade ornaments upon my naughty hands and pray the holiday fitness into strands. Top a hallmark star and needles high, but in that heroin hope, that lullaby of love is strung limp, lumbering, cold as bark, yet sung on by chemical jingles at work. And that Macy's Day irony, we'd all agree. Ho ho's my corpse, a pastiche of a pear tree.